to today's version of uh, the International Inverse Problem Seminar. So we have happy to have Takio Helin today from Laparanto University, connecting from Helsinki. Uh, and he will be talking about next frontier in Bayesian, Bayesian inverse problems, uh, optimal experimental design. So thanks a lot, Tapia, for uh, for giving uh, uh, the seminar today. Thank you very much for the for the kind invitation. It's it's a pleasure. I think this is a wonderful uh, seminar series, and uh, I'm I'm uh, very much promoting this to to uh, to our group to to participate. It's a it's a great thing. Um, so my my topic is is Bayesian inverse problems, and in in particular. Um, optimal experimental design. And so uh, I chose this a little bit provocative uh, uh, title or speculative title um, because um, it's not to say that uh, there hasn't been a, a lot of work done on optimal experimental design. And, uh, and uh, certainly th there has been also other uh, approaches to do experimental design for inverse problems like compressed sensing, and um, and other approaches, but but uh, but optimal experimental design in Bayesian inversion is still computa computationally very heavy uh, problem. It requires a large computational effort. And so why why I could imagine that that in in future this becomes more um, or or more people become focused on these sort of questions is that if we if we look at kind of an, a naive history on, on inverse problems. So we have had a, a period of uh, developing deterministic solvers for inverse problems. And uh, after after that, the uh, last decay was really a triumph of, of Bayesian approach and statistical approach to, to inverse problems, uncertainty quantification. And I, I guess now we are kind of going through this data-based methods and, and, and learning-based uh, enhanced methods to inverse problems and with the with the increase of computational power and resources you know we we are able to solve bigger and uh, bigger and bigger problems all the time so um but what somehow doesn't maybe change too much is that uh, in in the in the foreseeable future is that uh how we how we measure things and uh of, of course we can measure more accurately but but many measurements in inverse problems can be uh, economically i mean they can be simply costly to do or, or they can be limited by some other factor for example in in uh, cd imaging you can't expose the patient to too much radiation so you want to kind of optimize um also your ex experimental setting experimental design and it could be that this increase of computational resources now brings this Bayesian optimal experimental design kind of more and more feasible for these large scale problems. But I'll I'll go into this computational effort more in detail. So uh, so let me kind of start by first setting up some notations. So of course we are in the business of solving X when some data y is given and we have some some mathematical model connecting connecting x and y now g is my forward mapping and uh, i add here this parameter d which uh, kind of represents the uh, experimental design it, it represents something in the in the uh, measurement setting that i'm i'm kind of uh, involved with and psi here is my my measurement noise, so I assume additive noise. So uh, this calligraphic G, now I assume a setting where this calligraphic G is uh, a composition of two mappings. So there's some forward map F, that mapping between uh, function spaces, let's say X and X dash, that could be like related to the to the BD that I, or I have or some integral operator. Then I compose that with the evaluation map uh, calligraphic O, which maps it to, to some um, Euclidean space uh, denoted by this Y here. 
And so uh, this design parameter D um, here specifies this observation or this evaluation map of how this observation is done. So it could be, for example, sensor locations, but in general, I'm kind of thinking about applying some linear functionals, um, linear functionals um, to, um, to this uh, um, forward map F that gives me some, some real number. And so here, for example, the design parameter would be um, uh, like a K sensor locations, for example. But but of course, this is quite general uh, setting and I'm, I'm not kind of um, limited to this setting. So one could imagine, and, and one other approach that I'm not talking about here, but one other approach that uh, interests me a lot is that uh, what if I'm building a surrogate model based on some, some data? some training data so so maybe my uh, my design variable could be that where do i want to uh, where do i want to kind of um, uh, um, kind of evaluate my true forward mapping and and add that that data to my training data so that i somehow uh, improve my information so there's kind of various different settings how, how you can how you can put together a design problem of course now I'm uh, um, adopting here the Bayesian approach. Uh, so I assume that mu naught is some prior distribution on this uh, x space x. And uh, the Bayes formula gives me under quite uh, kind of uh, uh, like uh, uh, some, somehow um, uh, simple assumptions gives me the posterior distribution um, uh, and 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 base formula somehow states basically what is the Rado Nicodium derivative between the posterior and the prior. So saying that um, posterior is absolutely continuous with respect to prior, and then the Rado Nicodium derivative is given as a fraction of um, or as a ratio of the uh, likelihood distribution and the marginal distribution of y. Now here I, I kind of use the convention that mu stands for a measure, mu not prior, mu y here is the posterior, and pi is a kind of general notation for some density function that, that should be kind of uh, obvious from the context what it represents. Okay, so what, what is Bayesian optimal experimental design? So the question is how to choose choose this design variable. So what do you want to what do you want to see? You want to kind of uh, quantify information that this posterior distribution contains and you want to uh, kind of maximize that information of course. So so uh, but um, how to how to quantify information. So one way to look at this this which is also called expected information gain is that you you kind of postulate or you define an expected utility function capital U, which is defined as the expectation of um, uh, some local utility between, uh, or expectation over the joint Bayesian distribution of X and Y and uh, over the function, uh, utility function U, which is dependent on your unknown and your data vector, and of course the design. And here the expected information gain would be to choose U in such a way that you end up with the expectation of uh, Kulpa-Kleibler divergence between the posterior distribution and the prior distribution. So when you kind of maximize this distance, so you're you are making such a measurement that uh, the posterior is as far as possible from the prior. So, so you have you know, added as much information as you can. And if you kind of, uh, evaluate this or, or if you write down what this kulpa kleibler uh, divergence is and the expectation, so you end up with this sort of double integral. So you are you're integrating over the joint uh, space of X and, and Y or product space of X and Y. And you have this log of this ratio of your uh, likelihood and the marginal. And this is integrated over the joint distribution of X and Y. Okay, and uh, the optimal design in this case would be obviously the design uh, parameter that maximizes this capital U. 
Okay, well, in practice, this is certainly not some nice convex function, but it can have multiple local minima and, and it can be quite complicated. But, but uh, I mean, in practice, my, my experience it, is that it is still quite smooth function. Uh, so what, what are the challenges with this Bayesian OED task? And, and why do we come to that first point that I was saying that this, this requires a lot of computational effort is that uh, now what you're doing is you're basically having a double integral over a very high dimensional space as we usually work with in inverse problems. And on top of that, you're adding uh, an optimization problem. So you, you have to have you, you have to basically um, carry out some, some expensive Monte Carlo simulation to approximate this double integral here. And on top of that, for each of those, you know, Monte Carlo evaluations give you just one evaluation of this function that you, you try to optimize. But what is actually more in this uh, expected information gain is that now you are you are in the in the setting where, where you have to actually implement a nested Monte Carlo. Namely, you cannot uh, evaluate this marginal density only in some particular uh, special cases that I will come back to later. But you, in general, you cannot evaluate this uh, marginal density explicitly, and you have to implement an nested Monte Carlo method. Uh, uh, for, to evaluate this. So meaning that for each sample that you um, create, so the sample being now the pair X and Y, you have to still make another Monte Carlo uh, simulation for this term. So, and uh, it's it's well known how, how this nested Monte Carlo behaves. So you will have convergence, um, very slow convergence to, so if capital M is number of samples, so your convergence rate will be m to the power of minus one third. So it's even faster than, uh, sorry, it's even slower than the, the usual Monte Carlo one over square, square root of m. So what this is saying that there's there's definitely a bit like a demand to uh, develop uh, no, like stable numerical approximation schemes for this problem in order to tackle a large scale problems. So if you if you look at look at uh, uh, like any research papers around inverse problems with that. And, and there are many. So usually the uh, applications are actually quite modest uh, in terms of dimensionality that, that you see here, simply because, I mean, it's just such a big uh, and costly task. Uh, the other option is that you, you are able to actually um, uh, evaluate this explicitly but uh, I'll come back to that special case a little bit later. So of course, there are also other utilities that you could take. So here we are looking at the kullback library divergence between the posterior and prior, but you could also consider negative squared loss, which is just kind of averaging um, the distance to your estimator, whatever estimator you, you choose to have there. For example, the map estimator, CM estimator, conditional mean, I mean. Um, that's that. That's also a, a popular and well, I, I think, well uh, justified choice. Now, then, you if if you're familiar with Bayesian optimization, kind of a little bit detour here, but but Bayesian optimization postulates a, a very different utility that rewards for finding uh, like uh, optimal function values, sometimes called expected improvement, and then for sensor placement, you might have different types of. Um, uh, utilities via mutual information, conditional entropy, and so forth, so forward. And so I was saying about this special case. So uh, if it happens that you have a linear problem with Gaussian prior, Gaussian noise, then actually this double integral uh, has an explicit solution. And for this negative squared loss, that that uh, kind of is, is proportional to to the negative trace of the posterior covariance operator, and for this informa expected information gain, it is proportional to the minus log determinant of the posterior covariance operator. Okay, 
So um, sometimes this is referred to as A optimality or average optimality, and this is uh, D optimality or uh, determinant uh, uh, optimality condition. But in, in these particular cases, um, you can um, you you can tackle a little bit higher dimensional problems. So therefore, it's it's super interesting to understand that when is your, for example, for nonlinear problems, when is linearization um, somehow, or, or or let's say that if if you have a good linearization for your nonlinear problem with respect to somehow where where your prior is is supported, so. Um, what sort of error do you induce to the expected utility and to the designs that you um, you actually um, uh, achieve with this method? And and uh, kind of surprisingly, um, I think this this hasn't been um, well addressed in the literature yet. So there is a lot of um, a lot of um, kind of studies going into uh, actually evaluation of this and a very kind of uh, great development towards evaluation of the expected utility. But but somehow the numerical analysis, I think, isn't yet kind of complete. And uh, as I was saying, there has been a lot of, a lot of literature uh, on this topic. So I think uh, starting from like uh, early last decade, you know, uh, different sequential greedy optimization uh, like uh, strategies. Then there's a lot of work on this uh, nested Monte Carlo, sometimes called double loop Monte Carlo methods, and um, you know, multi multi level approaches. There's infinite dimensional uh, formulation of these problems. So Alexanderian has been, and 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 uh, co-authors have been very very um, active. Uh, some work on, on imaging problems. I will talk about later about X-ray imaging and our CT imaging and how that how does that work. Um, there's also variation on Bayes approach. I think these are very interesting work by Adam Foster and, and co-authors. And if you're interested in general, there are uh, really good review papers. So this Challenger Verdinelli is kind of classic, but, but there's also very recent uh, excellent work to read. So, but uh, let's let's now go into this numerical analysis part and and kind of uh, um, think about that a little bit. So, how to approach this problem? So, I think there are um, mainly, or you could see it as as kind of maybe a little bit simplifying way, but 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 you could see it uh, by having two layers of approximation. So. So first of all, we uh, if if you have a very heavy um, forward mapping that takes lots of computational resources, like it takes like a second on your on your laptop. So you might want to have something uh, that that actually ac actually um, a faster faster surrogate approximation. So that's that's one source of your uh, errors. But then of course you have also this particle approximation or Monte Carlo approximation that you, you need to somehow carry out in, in order to evaluate actually those integrals. So the key questions that I've been now lately interested in is the kind of the convergence of this UMN to, to you under different utilities. And um, so what can we say about that conver convergence? And of course, what can we say about the stability of this design? So so do they do they do the uh, designs that I I kind of uh, find through these approximative schemes are they are they converging to the to the kind of right designs at the limit? <clears throat> so uh, let me kind of a uh, little bit discuss some results and and I don't mean to go into proofs in. Um, I mean, the proofs are not really um, somehow. Don't, I mean, they, they are pretty straightforward, but but somewhat technical. So this is a recent paper by me and uh, and and my my group, uh, Duke Lam Duong, uh, who is my postdoc, and Rodrigo Royo Garcia, who is my doctoral student, 
at LUT University. So we we showed that now if you if you focus only on uh, the surrogate approximation, that's what I well I I'll, I'll be talking about because the I think that Monte Carlo approximation is is so well um, understood. So if you focus on the surrogate uh, approximation in a very very general setting, so we we assume that we have some approximative likelihood uh, density here that approximates the true true uh, likelihood density uh, with respect to kulpa kleipler uh, divergence and on average averaged over the prior and and we have like an approximation rate that we can we can show here so notice now this is a very general uh, assumption here so i'm not assuming that i have an inverse problem at all i'm just talking about the the likelihood distribution of, of a Bayesian in, inference and, uh, problem and, and, and somehow having some sort of control over the co control over the uh, approximation of the density. So suppose I have this uniformly over my design space. Then I, I assume also that uh, that uh, these likelihoods satisfy certain moment bound. And, uh, let me not go into into detail here. So if, if these uh, assumptions are satisfied, then there exists some kind of universal constant such that the, um, that the kind of the kind of L infinity, infinity norm of these uh, expected utilities uh, converge uh, with respect to square root of that that approximation rate that I had for the likelihoods. Moreover, uh, actually, this convergence rate is sharp in 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 the following particular sense that that you can and, and you can you know construct an easy linear um, one dimensional problem where where um, the uh, assumptions are satisfied, but the difference is um, is like uh, is the upper bound or is this upper bound, coincides with this upper bound up to up to a constant. So you can't in, in the in this generality, you can't really get faster convergence rate. But uh, also what is what is more so if you have if you can add like a assumption about uh, some sort of continuity assumption here regarding your um, your likelihood distribution. So here continuity is meant uh, again in this particular sense. So you look at the, uh, you look at some neighborhood of of your design uh, variable, and you look kind of you perturb that design variable. This p is now the the kind of uh, perturbed variable. You look at the difference uh, of these uh, two densities with res likelihood densities with respect to the kulpa kleipler divergence and then you can take the expectation with respect to the prior uh, if you can say that this mapping here is continuous um, uh, around some neighborhood of any design variable then the following uh, or, or then the following happens so let's um, so so we we also kind of uh, if if dn star now uh, denotes the opti an optimal design for the for the surrogate problem where n is kind of my uh, somehow the level of my approximation or uh, gr some grid or or some sort of uh, dimension of my surrogate, then uh, any accumulation point of these d n star uh, kind of designs. Any accumulation point d star is actually a maximizer of this true expected utility. This is kind of a, a gamma convergence result saying that okay, um, a very weak result saying that um, that these maximizers um, form such a set that any accumulation point is a maximizer of the of the limiting functional. And uh, you can also show that uh, 
the limit limit uh, converges the limiting the, the, the expected utility is, is also uh, stable in this sense okay um, just some brief ideas regarding the proofs so there's two main ingredients so first of all it's just kind of brute force uh, upper bound for this uh, difference between two expected utilities so here I, I uh, uh, kind of uh, drop the dependence on D because it doesn't doesn't matter here so much so, so for for a fixed design you can look at two expected utilities and you can show that uh, an upper bound you, you get an upper bound by uh, a constant time square root of exactly this approximation rate that we, we assumed now this uh, in, in practice this square root will dominate as, as this will go to zero uh, kind of go, become small so the square root will dominate and the uh, and the constant will depend on the moment bounds that I assumed earlier so this is kind of uh, underlying or somehow somehow underlying the the first result this sort of uh, this sort of upper bound and uh, for the second result which is kind of showing uh, showing this gamma convergence type of uh, result so um, so you can you can simply start to kind of consider this sort of triangle inequality so if you if you have your limiting uh, utility evaluated at D and then you have UN at some other um, design DN. So the triangle inequality uh, would be that this is bounded by UD minus UDN plus this supremum over um, over all designs of U and UN. So, um, so from the first, first uh, uh, theorem we get convergence rate for the second part and now we use that continuity of this utility to make this first first term convergence converge now of course this is a little bit you know un, uh, unsatisfactory in, in the sense that it would be nice to have like some some concrete concrete convergence rates but but i guess unfortunately you cannot um you cannot uh, get convergence uh, rates for the designs unless you really you really have more concrete knowledge about the problem at hand and and what 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 type of design space you have so here i'm assuming very general design space which has some topology some some kind of convergence meaning of convergence okay but maybe if we go go towards more practical results so what does it mean for for uh, our usual inverse problems so if we have um kind of a nonlinear inverse problems like in the very beginning where uh, where the noise is gaussian so what this means is now that the likelihood is a gaussian um, distribution which is centered at g of x and d e. so uh, in this case suppose now Okay, this would be k, this p here. But but so suppose g and uh, g and map from now from the product of x and design space to r k, and uh, so what happens is that the, the moment bounds uh, that that we have correspond to uh, the following assumptions, which mean that that both g and g n are in L infinity with respect to the design variable and um, somehow um, so what is L infinity is actually the L4 um, uh, norm with respect to the prior prior measure and uh, moreover if G is continuous with respect to D so so this will imply the continuity condition that that we had earlier and um, secondly so so the kulpa leibler divergence between the two gaussians implies that actually that condition is simply like uh, like this sort of l2 type approximation rate so if we know that the expectation over the prior of g minus gn um 
So you, you average over X and this norm gamma here kind of stands for the norm that you have uh, in the, in the uh, image space. So this will kind of uh, need to be controlled. And so if it's controlled by some epsilon on N, so then you get the result that, that um, uh, I, I was showing earlier. So, so you have like L infinity uh, convergence for the expected utility at the, with, with kind of losing a little bit uh, this approximation rate. So you have to put that square root there. Moreover, it's the same thing. So if dn star is the maximizing sequence for u and then uh, any accumulation point is a maximizer of u. So this is already quite practical, um, practical result in the sense that it says that um, that this expected uh, information gain is robust in terms of perturbations uh, with, with surrogate models. So now, now the next step is, of course, to find like super good surrogate models that are, are uh, that that somehow for, for to find good surrogate models for for any problems that that you are dealing with. Okay, uh, so in in our paper we had a kind of some sanity checks. Let me let me show um, maybe one of the simpler ones. So let's consider just a, a, a super simple uh, mapping from from uh, uh, one dimension. So from unit interval to R2, we have this particular expression and we'd like to optimize uh, both components. So, so D1 and D2 represent our design variable, which is in unit interval. So design space is a unit interval. Notice that our results earlier didn't really depend on the prior. So I can choose any prior. I, here I, I just for, for simplicity kind of consider uniform prior on that uniform uh, unit interval and uh, I take the, <clears throat> the surrogate model that first comes to mind so I, I just consider gn as the piecewise linear interpolation and uh, now if I look at the uh, the utility functions so these are now functions from R2 or, or kind of unit uh, unit um, uh, unit square to, uh, to uh, positive real numbers. <clears throat> so here is the, the kind of the true utility computed with very, very kind of very accurate model. And uh, approximation rates are given here. So uh, in these three different pictures, so notice different scale, a little bit, no, sorry, they actually the same scale in all pictures. Okay, good. So uh, on the right upper corner, we have just like n grid points and, and here we have uh, 33 and here we have 257. So clearly we see like a decay in uh, decay in the, in the approximation error of the expected utility. And actually that approximation error matches well with what we are, what we are expecting. So this uh, O, uh, n uh, to the power minus two is, is what you would expect from the numerical approximation. And uh, the red curve here corresponds to the left-hand side of our, our theorem. And uh, the blue curve corresponds to the right-hand side. So they seem to be converging exactly like um, we are expecting. So, so here on the x-axis is the number of grid points that I use for linear interpolation. And on the y-axis is just the just the approximation error. Good. Now there will be a discontinuity in this in this talk in the sense that now I jump to, to problems where I would like to use uh, a, a kind of a, a numerical analysis and, and like uh, results that I have uh, that we have you know discussed here, but uh, so far I can't. And so so. Uh, this is kind of sequential learning and then some variational variational me methods to make design in X-ray imaging a little bit more um, kind of um, um, easier. Okay, so for uh, again for for just notation, so let's just um, I guess most of the audience are familiar with uh, with the most maybe most classical inverse problem CT imaging, it's a Radon transform. 
G is here my my uh, random transform, and I change now I change a notation a little bit. So F is my unknown in this case. So as earlier it was F, but somehow here F makes uh, earlier it was X, but here F makes more um, kind of is more convenient, where where as X is now the a two-dimensional uh, kind of pa uh, parameter uh, of of the uh, of, of the function f. So g takes f and and makes a line integral over this this line, which is parameterized by theta, which is the angle you, uh, you on on the unit circle, and uh, and s is somehow the distance to distance to origin. So what we would like to do here is. Uh, greedy experimental design. So, so the question is that supposed we have uh, you know n angles and we are we are we have already observed observed um, our unknown from those n angles. So we have uh, a, a kind of we have the corresponding data available. So what's the next optimal angle? Uh, so in the beginning, of course, when you choose your first angle, it doesn't doesn't uh, matter at all. But but uh, how about the next one? I mean, it's not um, not so straightforward. However, I mean, if if um, so, if if somehow if you don't if you don't really have you have some sort of isotropic prior information, so it's pretty. Uh, kind of uh, straightforward to see that um, by, also by numerical simulations or or by by good intuition that that what happens is that okay you choose first angle um, uh, that being whatever let's say zero and the next one will be ninety degrees and the the following third angle will be either forty five or or one hundred thirty five and so forth so. So that doesn't uh, play too much role, and that's because because uh, in the Gauss, if you have Gaussian prior, so so then the posterior you have a linear problem, and the posterior covariance is not dependent on your data. So actually, you can do this design already already um, offline. So um, but what what we are kind of interested in is is edge preserving reconstructions and and designs that that somehow try to recovering the edges well so um so in the following what i will do is is i will assume that i have a narrow sensor that i i use to measure and i can move the sensor also I, so i can kind of manipulate the distance from from the origin and the angle and so what I will I will try to um, what I will try to do is I will kind of use uh, a non Gaussian prior, so in in Bayesian inversion to to obtain reconstructions that have like sharp edges. You usually uh, turn into total variation or pairs of penalties and and kind of postulate prior distributions that kind of try to emulate their their behavior. However, you know, high dimensional in, for a high dimensional inverse problem, having this non-Gaussian joint distribution means that I have to go into I have to go into um, uh, uh, I have to go into this Monte Carlo business and okay, having a high dimensional problem. So there's you know massive computational effort that awaits me. So some approximations are needed, and uh, so then our Kind of idea was that okay, we want to do some sort of variational approximations by by Gaussian methods and by by Gaussian Gaussian distributions in order to get to get to the uh, setup where we can explicitly solve these utility functions. This idea um, of of lack diffusivity is something that works very well. So let me just briefly describe it. So, for in the deterministic this deterministic setting. So the idea is due to Vogel and Oman from mid nineties. So what you do is you kind of take the usual total variation functional and you smoothen it by by some epsilon in the following sense, so that um, so that it kind of becomes uh, a little bit more differentiable around zero. And so 
um, you, you try to minimize uh, the following function where you have your data fidelity term, sorry, P should be D here, uh, the design variable, and you have this psi, the, the edge promoting penalty term. And uh, okay, so the goal is of goal is to minimize that, and and how you can approach, uh, how you can achieve that is that you you in, initialize and, and you do the iteration as follows. So you approximate approximate your um, your penalty term with something which is quadratic, uh, but depends on on your previous iterate, and um, and actually actually. Uh, in the denoising problem, you can even show that this, uh, you, you can show convergent results. That being said, uh, to my knowledge, if there's somebody who knows, but correct me, but to my knowledge, there's no convergence result for, for, for the inverse problem setting in, in this case. But anyway, so, so because you can, you can, uh, 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 you, you kind of use this iteration where you use these quadratic penalty terms. So this brings, um, uh, to, uh, to to mind the the Gaussian distributions and the Gaussian prior distributions in the Bayesian setting. Now let me, in the interest of time, jump over this um, kind of more specific uh, definition of what is quadratic functional are. But let me just say that actually, um, although we kind of came up with with this idea independently. I should say that this certainly was, we were not the first. So for example, uh, uh, or, or to our knowledge, uh, Calvetti and, and Somersalo uh, already uh, had this idea in 2008. So so this is a kind of a very nice, nice idea also for general Bayesian inversion. Um, so, um, so, so, okay, so the idea for OED here is the following. So that if, if Y kind of denotes your uh, measurement vectors up to K experiments and uh, DK are the first K uh, design variables. So you in it is initialize, you start with some angle and at the K step, you do the following. So given the data that you have uh, acquired by then, you find the maximum a posterior estimate for the posterior, so you basically do the deterministic lack diffusivity iteration, and then you, you proceed as fol follows. So you update the prior um, by, by the Gaussian approximation that you, you get from the lack diffusivity, and uh, you, you formulate a Gaussian posterior approximation using that prior. So you have linear, linear problem, you have uh, a Gaussian prior uh, from this approximation. So you get some approximation for the posterior, which is Gaussian. There, then you can solve uh, the expected utility explicitly. So you only have to evaluate this uh, uh, kind of determinants of the covariance op operator, and then you optimize uh, the angle. Also, in this case, you op optimize the distance to the distance to the origin. Okay. And uh, so then you continue acquire next data. So let me just finish by showing some some pictures how this works. So um, so so here the idea is that you by choosing a very narrow uh, sensor you you expose less radiation. So we 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 maybe want to con kind of compare this method to uh, for example having a full width sensor and an equi angular imaging. So um, just to uh, state briefly, so we can we can kind of show that um, even with a very sparse discretization of, of the of the problem, this this narrow sensor strategy leads into um, kind of uh, uh, like a better relative L two errors for uh, different kind of simple simple um, phantoms. Maybe maybe let me let me show this image, which kind of highlights how how this I, I, how this kind of method uh, kind of uh, automatically aims to construct the edges from the image by the by choosing kind of good good angles and 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 like locations for the sensor. So here it's after two projections, after four, six, eight, and so forth. 
um, just to compare with the full width uh, projections with which are equiangular. So here already, if you have four equiangular um, uh, uh, full width sensor kind of uh, images, so it's it's kind of close. So, but we we benefit a little bit, but there's not such a such a massive difference anymore in the reconstruction. Now, if we look at shape phantom, uh, she, she, sorry, shape Logan phantoms, um, we can we can kind of see similar uh, similar behavior that that somehow to to certain certain extent to certain number of projections, uh, this optimization is is uh, op optimization scheme with this lack diffusivity outperforms. Um, somehow this equiangular full width when compared to compared to same amount of exposure but of course when you start to get more and more data in so then it doesn't really any any more benefit in this problem to to kind of uh, specify maybe this also shows quite nicely how um how this method is is aiming to or is, is kind of uh, uh, able to to find the edges in the image, so this is after 20 and this is 40 projections. This is somehow same amount of radiation with full width sensor. And here is for Gaussian prior. So also in this sense, it's clear that <clears throat> having this TV type of uh, prior helps. So let me let me just say in the end that, um, so I, I think this, this first part of this talk about this numerical stability of <coughs> <clears throat> stability results related to this expected utility i think they give now us uh, they give us now like more complete picture of of the uh, how 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 uh, how to approximate these uh, expected utilities <clears throat> so so now we are able to really like uh, balance between choosing a very <clears throat> very fast surrogate and the number of samples used in the <clears throat> nested Monte Carlo. Now I talked about only this expected information gain, A optimality type of things can be <clears throat> handled with similar techniques that only kind of results into Hillinger distances instead. <clears throat> and also this um, Gaussian approximation to variational approximation scheme for this lack diffusivity uh, inspired Bayesian <clears throat> sequential Bayesian OED it has benefits to using, uh, for example, Laplace approximation for, for, for this sort of thing because we we all only use the first <coughs> first kind of uh, uh, derivative of of the functional Fresh derivative of the functional. And what what I skipped there was that actually the um, somehow the approximation uh, can be seen in that the tangent planes of the posterior potential kind of coincide at the mode with the, with the true functional. Okay, but let me uh, stop here by by just showing some some references where where these um, problems were were studied and and thank you all for your attention. Thanks a lot, Tapia, for a very nice talk. Uh, so uh, uh, if anyone has a question, please please unmute yourself. Uh, and and ask questions. So I have one question. Uh, um, I think you assumed in the beginning that the noise was independent of your experimental design. Is that sort of realistic, uh, okay. or should you also think that? If you change the what you measure, you also have an you also change what the noise is going to be. Yeah, that that's a very good point. Uh, so that's true. I I assume that the noise is is independent. So um, so how that how that comes into play here is that um, uh, so it, so so there's two aspects to that. So how, how does it um, let me see how does it come into play play here for example if you have a linear problem and if everything is gaussian then so then it only affects this uh, posterior 
covariance, right? So, so you have have that uh, noise covariance is dependent also on d, not only the forward operator, and so it kind of changes this this minimization problem. But you're right that um, for this analysis here, <clears throat> so um, so. So for this general result, I mean, I mean here we just assume that the likelihoods can be approximated by something. So it's kind of built in here. But let me think if it changes for this special case now. Um, so um, I think here. I think it doesn't it doesn't play a role here if we can say that this this uh, approximation rate is kind of uniform over d. So in this case, the the co uh, noise covariance would become dependent on d, the design. And of course, you know, it could change your approximation scheme here, now approximation rate. But I think this should go through in the exactly in the same manner without. So the answer is uh, yes and no. So I, I think it doesn't doesn't affect the kind of general setting, the first two theorems here. But uh, but here, of course, you, you have to kind of check that, uh, check that, uh, uh, that, that this condition is then satisfied uniformly for D. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. But so no, I, think... I mean, but but I, I do assume additive noise here. So if you if, if you would go outside additive noise, and then then I mean, then yeah, then you have to think about a little bit. Uh, well, I mean, then you have probably some some noise uh, or likelihood model already in mind, like Watson or something that. So then you have to kind of go back to the general results. Yeah, I think that. Go into special, you know, design problems. You can you can think that more in detail. While well, if you stay in the sort of in the general theory, maybe this yeah. is yeah yeah. I, but but yeah, I agree that uh, that it it somehow of course, of course. I mean the the measurement surely changes. And and what I also assume here is that uh, that uh, measurement vector is somehow. Um, uh somehow belongs to kind of same space with with uh with different different d's for for any d so so yeah so this is kind of certainly not not answering to to all design problems but like maybe this is kind of quite common uh, prototypical way that that the inverse problems are discussed usually yeah, there's this wider question if your noise contains only also modeling error, yeah, so then then that comes a different. Yeah, different. yeah. Well, I mean that's that's super interesting problem. Yes, so that's uh, um, I, I'm not saying anything about that <laughs> at least yet. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Any other questions for Tapio? I, I was wondering, so you already touched upon this, but can you say a little bit about the intuition why sort of this information gain may be good uh, compared to the negative square loss uh, and what is sort of the numerical uh, comparison in terms of cost? Right. So, um, uh, so first, first of all, I mean, why? Uh, so, why is it why is it better? Better. Uh, so, so that's that's a good question. I'm not sure I would use the word better. It's just that the, it's just that this kind of goes back to. Um, how how information is usually quantified, like Shannon kind of 
information theory and and, and so forth so to to look at the Kullback library distance between between the posterior and and the uh, posterior and prior and that, that corresponding to somehow the gain of information that you have um um so I mean, coming from inverse problems and and more like familiar with regularization theory, I mean, I, I think this uh, negative squared loss is is quite flexible as well. Um, flexible as well because I mean, there's no no need or, or there's no reason why somehow why you should have, for example, the usual norm here. I mean, you could. You could uh, consider some some Bregman distance between between your functions, or or you could consider some special estimator that you have in mind that you want to you want to study. So, um, but uh, but right now, at least if you look in, look the re, uh, related literature, so it it seems to be more popular to use use this expected information gain. Maybe that comes from like more more like from statistical literature that that's the that's the choice usually. But there's there's a lot of freedom to choose the, or I I think that that, that there would be the or or I mean we we could you know choose also other types of utilities and, and study those how they how how they work. So I think there's a lot to do in this field still. Thanks. Thank you. Well, um, any other last round? Any other questions for Tapio? Otherwise, uh, let's thank the speaker again for, for a very nice talk. And thanks to everyone for, for coming to today's seminar.